Thanks so much for joining us today. God wants to do so much for you and through you, and we'd love to hear about it. Take a moment to send your story to stories at parkerhill.org. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by going to parkerhill.org slash give and choose the giving option that works best for you. Well, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. Well, hey, everybody. Hope you're having a great weekend so far. Hope you're enjoying this slightly warmer weather. And I'm so glad that you've included Parker Hill in your weekend plans, whether you're joining us at Dixon City or at our Wilkesbury location, at our Clark Summit location, wherever you happen to be right now, it's just good to be together again. I think this discipline of gathering is just so important as we stop at the beginning of a new week and just remember who God is, his heart for us, and his will for us. And today is week number three in this series called Someday. And we've been talking about the fact that all of us have a someday, and it's the choices we make today that will lead to our someday. And, you know, sometimes it's like that clip from the Honeymooners where your someday is really different in your imagination than it turns out to be in reality. Because we have the someday of our dreams, but then we have the someday of our actual experience, and we never get to the someday of our dreams, usually because the choices we make today, it's the choices we make today that determine the someday that we experience, or better yet, the someday that God wants for us to experience. So week number one in this series, a couple of weeks ago, we began with this principle. Let me go back to it. Your someday grows from what you plant today. So it's a principle that you find all throughout Scripture. Whatever you sow is what you reap. Whatever you plant is what you harvest. Your someday begins today. And we've been talking about this idea, talking about this principle, and for the remainder of our time today, we're talking about how this principle applies to our financial resources. And this is a good time of the year to talk about this because if you were to ask most people right now in January what they did too much of in December, most people would say, number one, I ate too much, and number two, I spent too much. Yeah, this is the time of the month when those credit card statements show up and we have all those interesting conversations in our homes. And and it almost without fail, every single year, the two top New Year's resolutions that people make are these. I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to get my finances in order, right? I'm going to get in shape physically and I'm going to get in shape financially. And here's what I've discovered, not just at this time of the year, but all throughout the year that there are so many people, and I talk to so many people who live under so much stress and so much pressure and experience so much conflict in their relationships because of this one area of our lives. So today I want to talk to you about how to make the kind of decisions today that lead to freedom and blessing and peace in your someday. But before I do that, let me just acknowledge that You know, whenever we talk about this subject, there's always a little bit of tension involved in it, isn't there? Because it's it's kind of personal, right? And sometimes it's pretty emotional. And whenever you talk about this subject in church, there's also a kind of a high level of suspicion because anytime a pastor of a church talks about money, people say, okay, what's the agenda behind it? So let me tell you the agenda behind this message in this series. My agenda is simply this, that I want every single person who's part of Parker Hill to experience the blessing and the peace that come from living life God's way, including in this area of our lives, in our, in our finances. So we're not, we're not raising any money. You can breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, we're not going to take a second offering after I get done talking today. Uh, my agenda is very simple. My agenda is this. I don't want to see any more marriages fall apart because of money problems. I don't want to see any more kids grow up in homes where there's incredible stress and tension over finances. I don't want us to pass on to our kids some of the habits that we may have learned from our parents that it took years for us to unwind. See, my my agenda is simply this. I want a good someday for you, and God wants a good someday for you, and I just believe that our lives will be blessed in our someday when we follow God's principles in every single one of our todays, okay? Okay. Now, this, this whole idea of living today in light of someday, it's an idea, it's a principle that you find all throughout the Bible. Here's an example in Proverbs chapter 6. It says this, go to the ant, you sluggard, 
no offense, uh, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. And so the writer of this proverb, Solomon, he's using nature as an example, using ants as an example. Ants work hard in one season in preparation for a future season. They do certain things today in preparation for someday. And so if you want to be a wise person, You want to live with wisdom, you follow that example. You live today in light of someday. So today I want to give you four principles, four decisions that we can make today that will lead us to a great someday in this area of our lives. Now let me just tell you right up front, today's message is not deeply theological. That'll be in a few weeks. Uh, Today's message is not highly intellectual. That'll be in about six weeks. Uh, But today's message is very, very, very practical. And sometimes in some areas of life, we just need it to be practical. In fact, most of what we're going to talk about today isn't going to be new information to you guys. Um, In fact, this is stuff that we talk about around here about once a year because we believe it's that important. But here's the challenge with this subject. The challenge is this, that the principles we're going to talk about today, they contradict the messages we hear every day in our culture. And so what happens over time is we just kind of slip into doing what everybody else is doing, and it seems okay, and it seems right, and every once in a while, we just need somebody to come come alongside us and say, no, 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 actually, what, what you're not seeing is that that isn't right. This is the way it should actually be. It's kind of like, um, kind of like kids who had these homework assignments, and uh, they gave the answers that they thought were right, but they weren't actually right. Like uh, one of the homework assignments said this, name the quadrilateral. So a quadrilateral would be a square or a rectangle or, a rectangle or a parallelogram or something like that. So this little girl named Hope, I love the way she, she responded here, name the quadri- quadrilateral. Bob, Sam, Kate, Harry, <laughs> It made sense to her, okay? It wasn't right, but it made sense to her. And then, and then there was this uh, homework question. It said, find the difference between eight and six. I love the way this kid responded. Find the difference between eight and six. Eight is all curly. Six is not. I mean, it made sense to him, right? It made sense to him. This is my favorite one right here. The question is, what ended in 1896? Here's what this kid said. 1895. 1895, I can do this all day long, right? Let me tell you, those kids are going somewhere, right? Not to college, but they're, they're going somewhere. And, and that's the way it is with all of us. I think sometimes we do things and we think things that seem right to us, and we just need somebody to come alongside of us and say, no, let me tell you what the actual truth is. And so that's what we're going to do today. We want to talk about what's actually true when it comes to how we handle what God has entrusted to us, not what everybody else thinks, not what we think is right, but the principles that God calls us to because he always calls us to principles that lead to a place of blessing, okay? So four decisions. And let me just say to those of you who are young, like you're in your teens, you're in your 20s, let me just encourage you to listen carefully, take some notes, and take this seriously because I'll be honest with you. I wish I could roll the clock back and learn some of these principles and actually apply them because I made some really bad mistakes in my 20s that it took me years to dig my way out of. And that's why we talk about this about once a year, and that's why I'm so passionate about this because I believe, especially if you're young, you make some good choices now, you reap the benefit of those choices later on. And, and you reap all kinds of blessings, the blessings of peace and, and harmony and relationships and, and freedom in your life. So four decisions. Here's the first one. Today, I will spend carefully. Today, I will spend carefully. Now, for many, many people in our culture, if you were to describe the way that they spend their money, the word carefully would not be the correct word. Uh, the word impulsively might work. Uh, emotionally might work. Haphazardly might be a good word. But, but carefully is the way that we need to spend because I think when it comes to our finances, I think the most important thing we can do today in light of our son, someday is to learn just to say no to some of our desires, some of our impulses. I love the way that Solomon, one of the, one of the kings of Israel, the wisest man who ever lived according to the Bible in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 said it. He said it this way. He said, whoever loves money 
It doesn't say whoever earns money, whoever has, has money, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Now, this isn't just for rich people. This isn't for poor people. This is not a money issue. This is a heart issue. What, what are you drawn toward? What is your attitude toward things? It's describing the person who's trying to fill an emptiness on the inside with a material thing. Somebody who, who just needs that next vacation, that next car, that next gray upgrade, whatever it is, and here's what he says. This is meaningless. In other words, it's empty. And I'll tell you what, it is so easy to slip into this kind of a mindset because we are surrounded by voices every single day that tell us we need to catch up. We need to upgrade. We got to get the new thing. We got to get the next thing. And, and it, we're just driven toward overspending. And I, I've, seen this, I've seen this in my family. I remember when my kids were younger, um, I have two girls, and when they were younger, we had a very generous uh, friend who gave each of them an American Girl doll. Now, uh, if, you, if you've never had girls, let me tell you what an American Girl doll is. An American Girl doll is a very expensive doll, and it's the kind of doll that you don't take outside and play with in the mud, okay? So my, my girls each had an American Girl doll, and in the process, somehow, we got on the mailing list for the American Girl doll catalog, Okay, And it was this interesting phenomenon. We would be going through life, and my kids would be very happy, very content, and they would suddenly get the American Girl doll catalog in the mail with all these accessories that they did not yet have for their American Girl dolls. And it suddenly occurred to them how deeply deprived they really were. And this happens to all of us. That doesn't just happen to kids. That happens to all of us, right? We grow up and the, the price tags just get bigger, right? Now, for you, it's probably not an American Girl Dial catalog, but maybe it's HGTV or wandering around the mall. You know what it is for me? Amazon Prime. One-click ordering. I, it's just way too easy. Like, I'm on a first-name basis with the FedEx guy. We had him over for Christmas dinner. You know, almost, not quite. But, it, it, I mean, it is really dangerous. So let me give you four questions to ask anytime you're about to spend some of the money that God has entrusted to you because it's originally his to begin with. Kind of a funnel that you run every spending decision through, okay? Number one, do I need this or just want it? And it's okay to buy stuff just because you want it. I'm not saying that that's wrong. You just got to be clear on that. And if you're under a lot of financial pressure, then you say, you know what, for this season of my life, I'm just going to buy stuff I need for now, or at least mostly that. Do I need it now or can it wait? Because sometimes if you wait a day or two or a week, suddenly that thing that you really wanted so bad, you realize you don't need so bad after all. You can actually get by without it. And then if you get through that, you say, okay, maybe I do need it, but do I need the name brand or can I buy the store brand? And then do I need to buy it new or can I buy it used. And so you, you kind of ask yourself all these hard questions that help you to spend more carefully. It's kind of like the old story of a guy who went to a monastery because he just wanted to take a few days to get a break from life and, and to reflect on things. And so he goes to the monastery and the monk welcomes him, shows him to his room, and he says to him, I hope your time here with us is blessed. If you need anything, let us know and we'll teach you how to live without it. And I think that's what we got to do. We got to teach ourselves how to live without some things. If we're going to live today in light of someday. Okay, so decision number one is this. I am going to spend carefully today in light of my someday that God is calling me to. Today, number two decision is this. I will borrow rarely. And I say rarely because I think there are times when debt is okay. I think it's okay to borrow money for a mortgage to have a house to live in. That is certainly a very reasonable kind of debt. There's some kind of debt that you may uh, leverage for business purposes that, that could be very acceptable. I'm no expert on business debt. But beyond those things, I would encourage you to make it your goal to live debt-free, which is so countercultural and goes against everything we hear every day. But I believe in light of someday, it's the best way to live today. It, because here's the problem with debt. When you borrow money, you're enjoying something today that you hope to pay for in your someday, right? And so what you're doing is you're trading your freedom someday for a little bit of fun today. 
And that's a really poor exchange to make. But this is so, so, so difficult for us because we live in a culture, let's be honest, where borrowing money has become a way of life. In fact, it's even made to sound attractive and exciting. I mean, just think about the names of the credit cards we use. Discover card. Because if you get this card, you can discover some things, and we all like to discover new things, right? I want to discover the beach, right? I want to discover the mountains. I want to discover uh, Disney World with my kids, and if I have the discover card, then I can discover lots of things. Or we have uh, Visa, right? It's everywhere you want to be, which is awesome, because I want to be shopping, and Visa's right there with me. I want to go to Ruth's Chris for dinner, and take all my friends, which, and it's a good thing because Visa's there too because it's everywhere I want to be. And I want to go on a cruise. And when I go on the cruise, Visa is right there with me. I mean, it sounds so good. And then there's MasterCard. Got to have a MasterCard because when you have a MasterCard, you are the master of your life, right? Because you are now in control. You can do whatever you want to do with your master card because you are now the master. But you know, listen, it, it, most of us have learned the hard way that that stuff can get out of control pretty quickly. And before you know it, your Discover card has led you to discover some things that you never wanted to discover like pressure and stress and marital conflict, Right? And, and Visa is everywhere you want to be, but then you wake up one day and you discover that Visa has taken you somewhere you never wanted to be. And, and MasterCard is great, but if you use your MasterCard too much, you wake up one day and realize you're not the master anymore. The bank is the master. The credit card company is the master. And, and that's why it says this in the book of Proverbs in chapter 22. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And that's just stating a fact of life, right? Like birds fly, fish swim, and the borrower is servant to the lender. That's just the way it works. If you don't believe me, skip your mortgage payment for a few months. The borrower is servant to the lender, and not just financially, but also emotionally, right? I mean, we, we know how that feels. You know, you, you're, you're just under a lot of stress trying to keep all the balls in the air. You get to a point maybe where you, you avoid even opening the mail because you don't want to read that late notice, or you don't want to see the numbers on that bill. Or, you know, you wish one of you could stay home and just take care of the kids, but you're under so much emotional strain and pressure from the past decisions that you can't do that, right? Or you have a, a friend who goes through some kind of calamity and just needs some financial help, and your heart goes out to him, but there ain't no money to go out with your heart because you're already committed somewhere else. The borrower is servant, to the lender. That's why Scripture would say, listen, here's the decision you make today. Borrow rarely. And, and here's one of the reasons we do this, I think. One of the reasons why we leverage debt so easily is we don't really understand sometimes how it works. And I don't know why. Maybe they change the way schools work today. But I never learned this growing up. I never learned this at, at home and never learned it at school, how, how interest actually works. And whenever I talk about this, I always try to give an example because I think for some people it's eye-opening, okay? So let me, let me give you an example here. Suppose you spend $15,000 upgrading your kitchen because you were watching Chip and Joanna on HGTV. And, uh, and you upgrade your kitchen, you put it on a typical credit card. We'll say typical would be 18% interest. And you make only the minimum monthly payment required by the credit card company that would be 2% of the outstanding balance, okay? So here, here's the question, and you can turn to somebody next to you and fill in the blank. How long will it take you to pay off the balance? Take a guess. At minimum monthly payments, 18% interest, how long will it take you to pay that off? All right, you ready? Here's the answer. 57 years. 57 years. You won't live in that house anymore. By the time you pay off that upgraded kitchen, probably you'll upgrade the kitchen two or three times more Like by the time you pay that off, okay? So let me, let me take a next step with this. Uh, the actual amount of money paid for that $15,000 kitchen upgrade would be, so if you, you pay it off, minimum over 57 years, interest in everything, what does that kitchen actually cost you? Turn to somebody next to you and venture a guess. How much did that actually cost? Ready? Here's the answer. 58000 and some change for your $15,000 kitchen. That's because of what's called compounding interest. 
And they call it compounding interest, as I said before, because it pounds you and it pounds you and it pounds you and it pounds you. Now, let me ask you something. Is that a wise way to live today in light of the someday that you want to have and God wants you to have? There's a book that came out a few years ago, um, interesting little book. It's simply entitled Well-Being. Uh, it was published by the Gallup organization. It was based on research that they had done with thousands of people in 150 different countries. And they took that research and tried to figure out how to define and how to achieve what they call well-being. Okay, not, not written by Christians, but, but really insightful. And in fact, in the introduction, I want to read this. Here's what the introduction said. The single biggest threat to our own well-being tends to be ourselves. Without even giving it much thought, we allow our short-term decisions to override what's best for our long-term well-being. In other words, we allow today to trump our someday. And we do that in a lot of areas of life, but one, one area of life where I think we tend to do that so easily as Americans is when it comes to material things and, 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 and borrowing to be able to have them right now. Okay, now, let me save you an email, okay? If you like to use your credit card because you get the airline points or the Amazon points and you pay it off every month without fail, okay, that's fine. But many, many people don't live that way. But if you actually have the discipline to do that, okay, that's great. But the, the first month you don't do that, get rid of it. Okay, so number one, number one, if it, here, here's what we got to do today in light of someday. Today, I will spend carefully. Today, I will borrow rarely. And today, I will save consistently. Again, not new information. I think we know these things. But listen again to what Proverbs has to say about this habit of life. Proverbs 21, verse 20, it says, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. In other words, there are reserves. There are things that have been stored up. But a foolish man devours all he has. In other words, if you consume and spend everything you take in, that would make you foolish. But if you're wise, you will live today in light of someday, and therefore you will live with a certain amount of foresight and discipline to set some things aside for later on, okay? That's the idea here of saving. Okay, now, just to, just to uh, really drive this home and help you to feel how important this can be, because this is something we tend to blow off real easy. I wanna give you some scenarios, okay? And, and, and I want you to think about these financial scenarios and think about what they would mean for you. And here, here's the, the contrast. Would this be a crisis or cared for, okay? I'll give you five or six scenarios here, and I want you to just think through them and answer these, not out loud, okay, just in your own thoughts. What would this mean for you financially? Here's the first one. Your car's transmission fails, so it starts to slip. You take it into the mechanic. The mechanic says you're going to need a whole new transmission, 2600 bucks. Crisis or cared for? Here's another one. Your furnace breaks down in the middle of winter at five degrees below zero. And so you call the furnace repair guy, he says thousand bucks to fix it, okay? Crisis or cared for? Now if you're a renter, hey, that's cared for, don't have to worry about it. But if you're the homeowner, crisis or cared for? Here's the third one. Your child, who was just eight years old yesterday it seems like, but is now 18 years old, is filling out college applications. And you begin to do the math, and you realize that even after the scholarships, even after all the grants, even after all that, you're still going to be on the hook for about $12,000. <laughs> Crisis or cared for? Here's the, here's the fourth one. Your daughter gets engaged. <laughs> That's a good thing, I suppose. Um, engagement leads to what? A wedding. And, and a wedding means... Save the dates, invitations, dresses, photographer, videographer, cake, uh, caterer, all of these things, okay? And so you start to add all this up. Crisis or cared for? One more, one more. You turn 55, and suddenly you get these mailings from AARP wanting you to join them. And people in their 20s start calling you sir or ma'am. You know, and you go to the gym to work out, and the staff goes over to make sure the defibrillator is still working, right? 
and then you realize that retirement, which always seemed so far away, is now just, you know, 10, 15 years away. Crisis or cared for? Now, let me be honest with you. The average American with many or most of those would probably have to say crisis. But here's what's so interesting about that. Those are common everyday scenarios. Those are things we kind of know, like, could happen. Like if you own a car, it's probably going to break down at some point. If you own your own home, there are things that you're going to have to fix eventually. If you have kids, they may grow up and fall in love and get married and move out of your house. That's a good thing. Um, You may eventually not have the health to work anymore, and so you're probably going to want to retire. Or maybe to put it in in a very positive thing, maybe, take all those negative things out, maybe you just want to take your kids to Disney World in four or five years. You know the best way to prepare for all those things? It's to start now. Because what happens if you wait till those things come and it becomes a crisis? What do you have to do to cover them? You have to go back to what we just talked about? You gotta borrow, right? Now, let me, again, let me address those of you who are young because the time to start preparing for the future is, is now because it makes all the difference in the world. Now, I'll give you an, an example of the difference that time makes when it comes to this discipline of saving, storing up you know, oil and wine, or in our case, dollars and cents. Kiplinger's magazine did an article on what it would take to have $500,000 in the bank by the time you're 65, and they're assuming an interest rate of 8%. That's not unreasonable. Uh, the average stock market return over the last 50 years has been 10%. So this isn't your bank account, okay? This is some kind of long long-term investment. But if you start at age 25 and you just kind of save $143 a month, that'll get you there. But if you wait 10 years and you say, finally, age 35, I'm going to settle down, I'm going to get serious about this, then then it's $335 a month, age 45, age 49. And if you wait until you're 55 and you want to retire with something like that, then it's $2,173 a month. See, time makes all the difference in this. But here's the most common response I hear from people whenever I talk about the need to save. Here's what people say. You know what? They say this. They say, you know what? That's a great idea. And someday, when I have extra money, I'm going to save. And guess what? That someday never comes. In fact, I think some of you may may legitimately say, I just don't know how I could do that. And I, I understand that. You just don't have a lot of financial margin. But for most of us, there's probably a way that we can make that happen. There's an author by the name of David Bach. He wrote nine best-selling books on personal financial management. And he came up with this concept. He calls it the latte factor. And let me explain the latte factor to you. He, it comes from a conversation he had with a couple. And, and they said that. They said, we, we just have no ability whatsoever to be able to save for our future. And so he began to probe a little bit, and he discovered that both of them would buy two lattes every day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. They would each do that, so they were spending $15 a day on lattes. And so he helped them to understand what that would mean if they took that and maybe drank water instead and invested that. And, and it came to be known as the latte factor. So on his website, he actually has something called the latte factor calculator. You should go try this. It's really interesting. So I I went on there to try it. And uh, what this does is you can use this to calculate what you would save if you took some money you're currently spending on things like bottled water or cigarettes or, you know, fast food or magazines or whatever it might be. And if you were to instead save that for something and what that could result in. So I went, I went on this thing and I tried it because here's my biggest problem is this. I spend too much money on coffee and eating out. Like I'll get two or three coffees a day at a drive through usually eat lunch out. Once in a while I'll get the Egg McMuffin for breakfast along with a coffee. I probably spend 20 to $25 a day on, on like coffee and eating out. It's just a bad habit. It really is. And the truth is, I could make my own coffee and bring my lunch to the office and probably spend $15 a day. But after all, what's $15 a day? That's no big deal, is it? Well, let me show you the math on that. So if you took $15 per day, invested at 7% interest, again, not your passbook savings account, some long-term investment. If I were to start doing that now in 10 years, man, I'd have like 81000 bucks. But here's why I wish I had figured this out 40 years ago. (laughs) If I were a millionaire right there just with coffee and fast food, that's what happens in 40 years. See, that's compounding interest. It can either be your best friend or your worst enemy. 
And, and, and so the point is simply this, that it, it's such an important discipline to prepare for the future, to begin early, and even just begin small. So let me, let me review one more time. Number one, today I'm going to spend carefully. Today I will borrow rarely. And today I will save consistently. And I want to add one more in here because this isn't a message about giving, but I think this is such an important discipline. Today I will give generously because I believe when we take some of what God has blessed us with and we become not reservoirs of that blessing but conduits of that blessing, when we give, it opens up God's favor on our lives. Listen to what it says again in Proverbs. It says this, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And we got to remember in those days it was an agricultural society. And, and, and there were no pesticides, by the way. There were no crop insurance, okay? Every time they planted a crop, they did it with hope and prayer, okay? And so this was saying, honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your crops. So they would reap the first olives, the first grapes, whatever it might be. They would give that back to God, basically saying a hailstorm could come next week and wipe out the rest of the crop. But God, first and foremost, we're going to honor you with what you provided for us. But here's the promise. If you do that, then your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. In other words, when we put God first, it just kind of opens the door to his supernatural involvement in our lives. And I can't really explain why that works, but I know it does work that when we give God the first and the best of what we have, everything else seems to fall into place and it releases his supernatural power in our lives. Debbie and I, for 25 years, have been married 25 years now, have always made it a habit to give away at least 10% of our income. I'll tell you what, I have no regrets about giving. I have lots of regrets about spending. No regrets about giving. And here's what I've come to believe. I believe that 90% with me and God is a lot better with 100% and just me in charge. 90% with me and God together is much better than 100% with just me. So let me just review this for you one more time. So today, in light of my someday, today I will spend carefully, today I will borrow rarely, today I will save consistently, today I will give generously so that someday I can live the life that God is calling me to live, a life of peace and freedom and generosity. So let me give you a homework assignment, okay? Here's your homework assignment. Um, First thing is I threw a lot of information at you. You can always go online and review it if you need to pick up a a fact or a website or something. But your homework assignment is this. Actually go home and think about this for 2018. If you're married, talk about this for 2018. And I'm going to make it really simple for you. Here's what you do. You draw a circle and you create three slices. And those three slices represent three things. What am I going to give? What am I going to save? What am I going to live on? Okay? Okay. And, and just start there. And don't think in terms of dollars. Just think in terms of percentages as you begin this year. Now, let me tell you what I think the ideal percentage is that, that will bless you. Give 10%, save 10%, live on the rest. Uh, I, we call it the 10 10 80 plan. It's been around for years. Many people operate this way. And I think it's just a wise, wise way to live, just 10 10 80 but let me, let me alter that just a little bit because maybe in your situation, you need to start at a little bit different place. So maybe you've accumulated a lot of debt in your life, and so you're going to give five and save five, and I think it's important to do that because it just maintains that habit and that discipline in your life. But you're going to live on 90, and a big chunk of that, you're just going to get serious about attacking that debt and getting rid of it. You may also need to get a second job, a side hustle to do that. Maybe you need to sell a bunch of stuff on eBay and Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and sell stuff to the point where your kids are gonna, afraid you're going to sell them, and, and you, just, you just attack that and get rid of that so that you can move back into that 10 10 plan. Others of you may be in a position where maybe um, you, know, you haven't saved for some things that are on the horizon, so you just need to live on about 70% for this year and save about 20% and give 10%. Others of you... You, you may be incredibly, incredibly blessed by God, and you're doing pretty well, and you're actually in a position where you don't even need to save anymore because you've got the basis covered for the future, and any more saving would just be hoarding. And so here's what yours would look like. You're just going to save 0%, and you're going to give 20%, live on 80%. I know somebody who actually lives this way. God has blessed them so much, they just said, you know what, God? I'm just going to live on 50%. I'm going to give the other 50% away. You can actually do that, you know. 
And then you get to the end of your life, you get to your someday, and you look back on incredible, incredible blessing that you've been a part of because of your generosity, okay? So let me tell you about what you can do that I think is so important with these first two. Here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to automate these two because these are the two things that require us to be more intentional and more disciplined. These are the things that, that tend to slip. And by automate, here's what I mean. You set up systems where these happen automatically. So talk about saving. If, if you work at a place that offers like a retirement plan or 401K and they just take it right out of your paycheck so you never see it, you kind of forget it was even there to begin with, you know, you automate that as much as you can, you do that. And then on the, on the saving part of it, there are even some really amazing pieces of technology. Like Dan White showed me this app. It's called Acorns. And what this will do is it, it's linked into a debit card, and every time you make a purchase, it rounds it up to the next full dollar, and it takes that extra and moves it into an investment account. I mean, like, you don't even feel it. And, and then you, it, it, it will also, on a regular basis, debit your account and move money to that as well. And so you can, you can just automate that so that it happens all the time. You can do the same thing with giving. Uh, Debbie and I, when it comes to giving, uh, we give to three organizations. We give to, to Parker Hill Church. That's obviously the bulk of our giving. We give to the Keystone Mission. Uh, we also support a child in Kenya. And so on, on all three of those, uh, those are automatically debited so that it's just, it's a priority to us. So we've just decided we're going to make that automatically happen. We automate the important, okay? So go home, talk about that, figure that out, figure out what that pie chart looks like for you. Now, I can't possibly answer every single question you might have about this subject in 30 minutes, but we do have a class that we offer twice a year. It's called Financial Peace University, and uh, it's a great next step to take. It's a nine-week class, 10-week class, actually, with biblical principles that are put in order that makes it really easy to follow. It features Dave Ramsey. You may have heard him on the radio. He's a great, great communicator, and it's a very, very practical class no matter where you happen to be in your financial world. So Financial Peace University is happening at our Dixon City campus, also at our Wilkesbury campus. It begins on February 13th. That's a Tuesday night. Uh, the class time uh, this semester is, is only an hour, so we've reduced it down to an hour. And the very first class, you just show up to get a sample of it and decide if you want to come back. Okay, so there's no obligation. Show up once, figure out what it's all about. There's no risk in that. And if you've never taken the class, I would encourage you to, not just for your sake, but for the sake of your kids, for the sake of the legacy that you want to be. Here's how you sign up. You can go on our website, parkerhill.org slash FPU. You can stop out at the uh, Next Steps area. Note that on a connection card. Let them know you want to be a part of it, and we'll get back in touch with you, okay? So let me just end by saying this. For some of you, even thinking about some of this stuff is so overwhelming. And I, I get that. I mean, I can remember times in my life when I could barely breathe financially. And to think about some of this stuff was just way beyond my ability to even process. And maybe you find yourself there today. And let me say this to you. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a struggle. And, and I'm not promising you that, that there'll be a windfall that's going to happen someday. It may be a struggle the rest of your life. But here's what I can promise you. You'll be able to live with a sense of peace, a sense of freedom, and you'll be able to live with God's favor on your life, and you'll set a great example for your kids and make a difference in generations to come if you can get a handle on this. And the best time to start is when? Now, today, for the sake of your someday. Okay? So we're going to wrap up next week with part four of this series called Someday. Right now, let me just pray with you before you go. So on every campus, just go ahead and stand, and let's uh, just thank God for his goodness to us. God, I, I thank you that the one debt that none of us could ever pay was paid by you. You paid for it with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We are forever grateful for that. And I pray that you would forgive us for those times when the things of this world have blinded us to your love for us and your heart for us. And I pray that maybe today would be a turning point for some families and for some people that just feel oppressed by this part of life because you don't want us to live that way. And God, I, I just pray that you would uh, make us great managers of the abundance that you've entrusted to us as people living at this time in history and in this part of the world. May we just recognize what you've given to us and use it wisely. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen.
Hey, thanks for being here, guys. We'll see you next week for part four of Someday.